Hi guys, how's everyone doing? Doing good, how are you doing? Uh, not bad, not bad. Good to see, good to see how to scare, scare everybody away. Okay, we got more coming. All right. Wait a couple, just a couple more minutes. We got five, a few more. I decided to hang out at the beach today, so. All right. All right. Okay, well, let us uh, let us continue. Welcome to your second week. Got a couple of things now. What I'm going to do right now is is I'm going to have a couple of files that I will send to you. I'm going to go over. We're going to get into chapter two. Start talking about a little bit about a little bit about mathematics and how to go about solving the problems that will be given. I uh, will be using a technique that really we, we're going to transfer that technique over to the chemistry part when we start doing calculations with respect to calculating how much product we get if we start off with X amount of reactant. Okay, so let's first begin with um, a, a short discussion on, let me find it, disappeared. There it is. A short discussion about accuracy versus precision. Okay. Now, occasionally, what does happen, people tend to uh, treat these as the same thing, but they're not, that's not totally correct. Okay. Accuracy is how close your true value whatever that true value is, or how close your measurement is to that true value. So we go around measuring things, and then we, we hope we get a number, and we, we hope that that number is as true to the true value as possible. When we compare that to precision, it's a little bit different. That's how close the measurements are relative to each other, okay? So we can, we kinda, we can demonstrate it by using a a, um, an example here where maybe we're taking some shots or we were shooting darts or something, but you can see that the center of this, of this target is what the true value is or whatever you're measuring, okay? So you go by and you do your thing and you're throwing shots, you're throwing uh, the target or your or darts and the plus signs represent where you hit, okay? So you can see these four hits are very close to each other. However, they are pretty far away from the true value in the center. This example is where accuracy is not, not good, not too good. But your precision is pretty good because they're, pretty, they're grouped up pretty good together. Okay? So another example, we get another target and you start doing your thing and you're just throwing them all over the place. Okay, so we got hits on the target, off the target, they're not even grouped together. And so in this example, your accuracy is no good. It's not good at all, really. And your precision is bad, okay? So the ultimate goal is to have an example like this where all of your shots are right as close as possible to the center. Everything is grouped together. And those is what we strive as scientists to obtain. Nine times out of 10, we get something where accuracy is lousy and precision is lousy because we're governed by the tools that we have. 
The point of all this is to, when we do calculations, you all know we put a number in the calculator, you end up with, you know, 30 digits. And sometimes people are, are want to present all those numbers. Well, that will be incorrect because your accuracy was not very good. It's dependent on the tool that you use to do whatever measurement you're doing. Okay. And so your answer should not be any more accurate as the accuracy of your measurement. Okay. All right, so with that in mind, let me share another, another um, um, word document, document, because we're gonna be using units in metric, okay? And we're, this chapter deals with converting from English to metric. And so um, the metric system, for some reason, just kinda gets confusing for some people. But it really is, and if we break it down, okay, we're going to be measuring mass, volume, and length, okay? So if you look at the first column with mass, one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. You can see on the far left. Now, one gram is equal to 10, what's called DG, which is, which is deci, decigrams, D-E-C-I. -E you remember that. Think of how many years in the decade? 10, okay? So there are 10 de decigrams here in this case for one gram. The next one down, one gram is equal to 100, 100 centigrams. How many years in a century? 100, okay? So therefore 100 centigrams are equal to one gram. <coughs> Milligrams, there's a thousand milligrams in one gram. How to remember that? And this may help you. How many years in the millennium? A thousand years in the millennium, M. Okay. And finally, the last one, which looks like a U with a little stick at the bottom there, that's called a micron. Okay. In one gram, there are one million microns. Now we move over to volume, the prefixes transfer over. We start off at one kiloliter, L is for liters, okay? One kiloliter, there's a thousand liters. And in one liter, guess what? There's 10 deciliters or 100 centiliters or 1,000 milliliters. And finally down at the bottom, in one liter, there are a million microliters, one million. And then over to the last one, the length, one kilometer, 1,000 meters, and then one meters, 10 decimeters, 100 centimeters, 1,000 millimeters, and one million microliters. So if you had a meter stick, in that distance, you have 10 decimeters. In that same distance, you got 100 centimeters. That same meter stick, you have a thousand millimeters and one million microliters. Okay, now everything up there in the table is a conversion factor. Okay, and now those conversion factors can be set up one of two ways. Like in the example here, where one kilogram is equal to one thousand grams, well, we can set it up where we got kilograms in the numerator and grams in the denominator or vice versa, where we got a thousand grams divided by one kilogram. Which one we use depends on what we're doing mathematically, because we're gonna keep track of the units. These, this same scenario can be made up when we talked about yesterday, or the last time about the stoichiometry, that's the ratio of reactants. We're gonna be using this same technique when we get into chemical reactions in their calculations, okay? so. What do we do? For example, you may have a problem that says, how many micrograms are there in 0 0.125 kilograms? Okay, so we write down what we know. We know that we're given, I should say, 0 0.125 kilograms. 
And then we're gonna get rid of kilograms. So we look up there for a factor that deals with kilograms and grams. And we can see from our table that there are a thousand grams in one kilogram. So we write it with a thousand grams in the numerator and kilogram in the denominator. Why? Because mathematically, the kilograms cancel. Denoted there by, the, by that red line. And so if we stop with the first factor, then our answer will be in units of grams. But the questions ask for units of micrograms. So we need one more factor. And we know that in one gram, there are a million micrograms. And so we throw in the second factor, keep track of our units, and then the math is on you. Plug it in the calculator. And so therefore in 0.125 kilograms, there are 125 million micrograms. Okay. Uh, quick question. Sure, go ahead. Um, any reason why we didn't label it at the end? Yeah. We're supposed to? I, yes, and that's, oh. that, that's my bad. <laughs> oh no, I just wanted to make sure. I just wanted yeah, to Yeah, yeah, sure. you are you're hundred percent correct. The uh, uh and I was gonna mention that that 125 million should have units of microgram. In fact, let's take care of that right now. Let's assume, assume that's a microgram for right now. Okay. So that being the case, then we can uh talk about some other things here. In the shapes table, we give you two conversion factors, three, excuse me, uh, going from English to metric. We give you that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, one pound is equal to 454 grams, and one quart is equal to uh, 946 milliliters, okay? Each one of those conversion factors can be set up accordingly, like one inch in the numerator or one inch in the denominator. And which one we use depends on the question that we're being asked and what units we're trying to get rid of. The ultimate goal is the final units are the units that you're looking for, be it centimeters here or be it grams of product X, okay? So, the point being that everything we're gonna be doing is set up in ratios, be it $50 per hour, we set it up as one hour per 50 bucks or 100 miles per hour, we can do it as state is shown here, okay? Quick reminder on your basic algebra, um, uh, because you know, keeping track of units, we gotta start canceling things out, but for example, A squared divided by A, unit-wise, we end up with A. A squared is just another way of writing A times A, okay? And if I sp uh, set, uh, spread it out, A squared, you can see that the A's can have two, two sets Two A's cancel out, leaving me with units of A, okay? Same is true, similar is when we're multiplying units, like units. A times A gives us A squared. I'm, I can say the letter A, but I can say banana times banana gives us banana squared, right? They're just units. And if, but if I add them, totally different. I can only add like units. So if I say one, pl one banana plus one banana, I got two bananas not banana square, okay? And if I, one banana minus one banana, I get nothing, zero, okay? So refresh your memory on, on your basic algebra. All right. Now, with respect to the English units, sometimes quarts, pints, gallons get a little bit confusing. This little thing here might help you. You see the big G? The big G represents one gallon. Within the big G, we have four Qs, which are quarts. There are four quarts in one gallon. And if we look inside the quart, we see two Ps. That represents pints. So there are two pints in one quart. And within the pint, you see two little Cs. That represents two cups. So two cups in one pint, two pints in one quart, four quarts in one gallon. And every one of those things, again, is a conversion factor that, that you can write like the ratio like we just, we just did, okay? All right, which brings us to chapter two. 
Yeah, like I said, those those two files, I will uh, email them to you, so you get you get them. All right. So chapter two, there's a lot of practice problems that you may want to get on there and, and work on them because mathematics, you know, a practice makes perfect. You know, if if your mathematics is fine, just knock them out. But if not, you need more practice. The problems, let me know, and I'll say see if I can get more to you. The more you do, the more confident you get with respect to, to the mathematics here. All right, so measurements. One thing about here with respect to answers is we need units. And like the previous one, I forgot to put the units. If we, if we just state a book weighs, weighs eight, well, it doesn't mean anything without units. You know, is it eight pounds, eight ounces, eight tons? You know, so units are, are crucial. Every measurement that we do, mass, volume, length, has a degree of uncertainty, okay? There's nothing out there, measurement tool-wise, that is 100% accurate. Even the highest laser beam, there is an uncertainty in that measurement. And so, so, so what that means is we have to estimate that last digit. That digit may be in the tenth place or it may be in the thousands place, but that Tommy. last. Hello? Want you chili dogs for dinner? Hello. Yeah. What's that? Chili dogs for dinner. Yeah. What's that? Oh, I think. Trina, Trina you're unmuted. Uh, Sorry. Trina, you, you invited us for dinner. What time? What you making? It's only chili dogs. I'm lazy. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, measurements. There's all a degree of uncertainty. All right, for length, our units that we generally use are centimeters, millimeters, meters, kilometers, and the micrometer, the micron, <clears throat> okay? Now, here's your tools of measurement. Notice the, 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 the ruler, the white ruler, a lot of degree of uncertainty compared to the, bo the bottom one, right? We got more increments. We can do a lot better measurement with the bottom one than we get with the top. What this tells you is if I take that number from uh, using the, the white ruler and I do some kind of mathematical function to it, whatever I'm doing, that my answer should not have more digits than the least accurate measurement tool. Okay, so I'll be limited. We call that significant figures. We're going to have more on that. Okay. All right. So, um, mass units, occasionally we use micro, uh, micro, uh, micrograms, but normally it's milligrams, kilograms, and grams. You can see the tools here. The one on the right is an analytical balance. We can get down to 0 0.001 plus or minus. The one on the left, we call that a triple, a triple beam balance, not as accurate, okay? So if we're weighing something out and we're using the, the balance on the, on the right, that may govern how many numbers or digits we can present our answer with. We call those digits, what we call those significant figures, and we'll have more on that. Now, mass and weight, being stuck on Earth, we kind of interchange that as far as mass and weight, but there is a difference, okay? Because mass is, is a measure of all the matter in whatever you're, you want to take the mass of, okay? Whereas weight is, is, is a measurement of the force of gravity. The equation for weight is equal to mass times gravity. Now, gravity is a constant. It's about 9.8 meters per second squared here on Earth, but it could be something else on another planet. And so the point being is, we go to the moon, you may weigh 170 pounds, but on the moon, you're gonna weigh 29 pounds. Why? Because the gravity constant is different on the moon. However, the amount of mass is constant. You're gonna have the same amount of mass on Earth than you have on, on the moon. So that's the difference between the two. Volume. The, the units that we use mostly are the liters, capital L, and uh, middle liters, lower, lowercase m, capital L. Occasionally we use kilometer, uh, 
kiloliters. One on these, the image on the right, kind of an example of this type of tools we use to measure. Uh, they're beakers and cylinders and syringes, and what we call pipettes and burettes, okay, measuring units. Now, what kind of units do, uh, does a syringe have in a hospital? Anybody by chance know? CC. CC. Uh, what, is, what does that represent? Does anybody know what that is? Cubic centimeters. Cubic centimeters. That's correct. Is that equivalent to anything else on the other unit in volume? Centimeters no, cubed, right? Centimeters cubed, CC. And I heard male liters. Is that what I heard? Yes. That's correct. So one CC is one is a cubic centimeter. It's a volume measurement. One centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter gives you one cubic centimeter, which is also equal to one milliliter. Okay. So one, one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter or one cc. Okay. Now we we went through that. So you you can see on top of the the slide up there, all the conversion factors you had that you can utilize to go from quarts to pints, pints to cups, gallons to quarts, et cetera. All right. Sometimes you're asked to measure the volume of something. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the error involved here is not realizing the scale that you're using where you started off with respect through this volume. So if we look at that, this is called a graduated cylinder in the far left, you need to see which direction you're going. So in here, we are going from bottom up because that's the zero point down at the bottom of the cylinder, okay? And so then the next thing we gotta look at, what are the increments? It looks like increments of one milliliter. So that number should be 21, and then this is where the uncertainty is happens. You, I may see it as 21.5. You may see it as 0.6 or 0.4. You're not incorrect. It's just that is what you are seeing, and that's the degree of uncertainty. Okay? That's correct. Victoria? Yes, milliliters. So, so we got here about, you know, maybe 21.6 milliliters. Okay. All right. Uh, let's clear that. Now, this brings us to what we call significant figures. Now, Significant doesn't mean that we totally ignore that number. That doesn't have any value. Yes, it has value. When we talk about significant figures, we are talking about, is it significant with respect to the mathematical function that we need to do to it? Is it something that we can count if we take these numbers to add, subtract, multiply, or divide? This is what we mean by significant figures, okay? Um, for example, the bathroom scale, maybe that can weigh you, you can weigh to the 10th place. Okay, compared to the surgical scale, maybe to the thousands plate. So the surgical scale would have a lot more significant figures, it's a lot more accurate. Okay. We use this one here, we use the two on the ruler on top. I mean, best guess. Well, what do people what do you guys think that measurement is? 29 something, right? It could be 29.2, right? So in that case, and we have three significant figures of 29.2. The bottom case, we can actually go maybe 29.25. So now we've added one more digit. We got more significant figures from the bottom measurement because the bottom one's a lot more accurate, okay? so. There are some rules with respect to determine whether a number is significant. Now go through the I'll go through the uh, the list, but it boils down to two questions. Okay, so I'll go through the list first, and then I'll come back and I'll introduce those two questions to ask yourself 
whether a number is significant or not, okay? For example, 4,895.2. All non-zeros are counted as significant. So in this case, there are five significant figures, okay? So numbers one through nine always count. Where the confusion sets in is when we start dealing with zeros. Okay? Now, leading zeros for numbers less than one, they are not counted as significant because all they're doing is setting your decimal place, okay? And so the zeros in front of the five do not count. And then five, four, five, four, they are integers, so they count. So this number here has only four significant figures. Now, any zero that is between two integers is counted as significant. So if you look at that zero between the three and the five, it's captive, as they say here. Therefore, it counts that the trailing zero after the five is not captive. So it doesn't count as being called significant. So here we have three sig figs from the number 3050. Second example, 0 0.002001. The first three zeros are leading zeros based on, on rule number two. And then the other zeros between the two and the one are captive. Therefore, count. There's only four sig figs. And then finally, trailing zeros. The zeros after a decimal point and a integer or a number count. 0 0.0880. The first two zeros are leading zeros and therefore don't count. The last zero after the last eight, because it there is an integer in front and there's a decimal point, it is counted as significant. So it has three sig figs. And finally, uh, 28,500 only has three figs. So given all that, you can ask yourself two questions when you're looking at zeros. There shouldn't be any question about the integers. They're going to count all the time. But if we take a look at uh, where are we at here, if we look at this zero right here, okay, and you're not sure, well, let, let's start with the first zero first two zero, and you're not sure does it count or not. First question to ask for that for, for the first two zeros, is there an integer in front? The answer is no, so they don't count, okay? So let's go to the last zero, ask the question, is there an integer in front of the last zero? The answer is yes. Is there a decimal point anywhere in the number? The answer is yes. Therefore, that last zero is counted as significant. So if you answer yes to those two questions, you shouldn't have a problem determining which is significant and which is not, okay? All right. So um, let's clear that real quick. So adding decimal points automatically makes something significant in a question. Okay, uh, that's a good question. And it, it, the question is this. Let me, uh, someone asked the question. Let me put it on the board here. And, okay, who can tell me how many six figs does this example have? Would it be five? Six. Abby, you got six, five? I think it's five. Five. Okay. Okay. Ask the two. question. Oh, five. Never mind. Yeah. I counted one too many zeros at the end. Exactly. Okay. And so ask the first two zeros are leading zeros. But if you forgot that, ask the ask the question for the first two zeros. Is there an integer in front? Answer is no. So those two zeros don't count. The last three zeros, is there an integer in front of those last three zeros? Yes. Is there a decimal point anywhere in that number? Yes. Therefore, they count. Therefore, the, the eights count, so you have a total of five. Okay? Let me see. That's, that is correct, Jackie. All right. So I could put uh, 
uh, an, almost an infinite number of zeros in front of the decimal point, and they won't count. Okay. All right. So uh, looking at this one here, the moment you put a decimal point in there, any zero counts. So if you look at 285.00, ask the same questions for the zeros. There's a decimal point. There's an integer. Therefore, that last number has five sig figs. Okay. You might Mr. Dwarf? Yes. Sorry. Uh, just to clarify it, so like the 0 0.8080000, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0, the one, the example you just did before, that has yeah. five sig figs, right? That is correct. Awesome. The, Thank you. The, the two zeros and the eight. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Now you might ask, well, why do why do we need to do this? Because we need to know the sig figs because what if, like I said earlier, when you do a mathematical function, your answer uh, shouldn't be any more accurate than the least accurate number. So let's take let's take that number and that number and we multiply those two numbers, okay? And if we do that, we're going to have a lot of numbers. But the answer should contain no more than four significant figures because the second one is the least accurate. And you cannot be more accurate than your least accurate number, okay? Whether you multiply, whether you divide, whether you add, or whether you subtract. I know one is tempted to get all those numbers on a calculator. And let me see if I can do that now. Let me... Um, Okay, let's do that. Let's take that example and we go uh, 489, 5.2. We're just going to multiply 0 0.1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 5, 4, and we get this big old answer here. Okay, now you might be tempted to just report that, but that yeah, would be incorrect because your number should have no more than four sig figs, which means here that we're going to truncate after that nine, and we're going to get into how we do that. So your answer should have no more than four significant figures, which we count from the left, starting from number two, and then go across four uh, places. So that ends up at the nine. So after the nine, we need to truncate, and this is where we're going to get into rounding in a second. So let's go back to um, that. All right, now, these are measurements, okay? But we have what are called exact numbers. So you learn to identify exact numbers. Why? Because they would not play a role when your final answer comes into play with respect to significant figures. So exactly if someone says like 14 people, a quantity, we're talking exactly 14 people. It's not like 14.1 people, right? It's exactly four people. A conversion factor, three feet per yard. Well, that three feet is, is exactly three feet per yard, okay? Or 100 pennies in a dollar, five iPads or a 12 pack, okay? Or a baker's dozen, which is what, 13, right? That's, those are exact numbers. So exact numbers do not play a factor with respect to determining how many sig figs you have. Okay. Quick, the question, uh, there's a, uh, Brian, you asked a question about adding. Let me get to uh, uh, an example of adding and you see how that comes into play. Okay. All right, so exact numbers, things that are measured uh, length, you know, volume, and mass. Those things are not exact, okay, because there's a degree of uncertainty when you measure something. Because you have a tool that you're measuring. So seven inches, 200 pounds, 10 ounces, those are not exact numbers and therefore would play a factor in determining your final answer. So anything measured is not exact, okay? So, with respect to sig fig rules, they don't apply to exact numbers. 
Okay, let's first determine, we identify how many sig figs we have here. So how many sig figs do we have at 5.05? We'd like to take that one. Three. We got three, three sig figs, right? Right. If you look at that zero, you're not sure, ask those two questions. Yes, there's an integer in front of it. Yes, there's a decimal point. And to really nail it, it's a captive zero between two integers. Okay, so yes, there's three. What about 1,200? What do you think? Two. No. Two. Two. Is that two of them? Okay. How about uh, 0 0.02020 here? Four. 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 Four, exactly. Those two front zeros are leading zeros. How about this one? Next one. 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 Okay, maybe this one's a little trickier. One. 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 Exactly one. Okay. Okay, maybe, maybe four. Oh, four. Four. no fair. I gave you the answer. Okay, five. What? Five. exactly five, and finally three. three, 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 three. Okay, everybody see that that zero does not count. Okay, so if I were to multiply five point zero five and twelve hundred, my my final answer should not have more than two sig figs. If I were to divide five point zero five by twelve hundred my final answer should have no more than two sig figs. Adding and subtracting is a little bit different. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, so this kind of just basically just summarizes what I just mentioned about looking for uh, the zeros and, you know, determining where there's a decimal and integer in front of it and help you to figure out how many sig figs it has. Okay, rounded. Pretty, this one's also pretty self-explanatory. If we need to round a number, we, we, we go to the number that we need to either keep the same or we need to boost it up to the next value, okay? And we do that by looking at the neighboring number. And if that neighboring number is less than five, then that number that we need to boost stays the same. If the number is greater than or equal to five, then we get a, that number needs to be moved up to the next value. Okay, the thing about rounding is we cannot, we cannot change the magnitude. So anytime we have a number, first thing to look at is what magnitude are we at? Are we at a thousand fact, a factor of a thousand versus say 500? Because we don't want to change that, okay? For example, down here, the bottom one says round to one sig fig. Okay, when you're given a problem like that, what you do is you find the one significant figure position. In this case, it's the first number, okay? If they would have said rounded to two, it would have been the next number. All right, so then we look at the neighbor, which is a four. We apply the rounding rules. It's less than five, so five remains five. Now, all the numbers that, that follow that five that are before the, the decimal point, we we put in a zero. We drop the four, put in a zero, okay? We don't want to drop up everything and just end up with five because what have you done? By dropping all those, the zeros, you have changed the magnitude, which you start off with 5,000. You're in a 5,000 range, and if you end up with the five, you change the magnitude by dropping those zeros. What do you want, $5,000 or five bucks, okay? So you got to be careful not, not to drop the magnitude. So what that means is that any number before the decimal point gets converted to a zero. Any number after the decimal point you can drop because if this was 5,400.2, 5, well, you, you can drop that point two decimal template. It's not going to change the magnitude of the number, okay? Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You don't wanna, don't wanna change the magnitude. We'll have some more examples here in a second. Okay, here they're asking you to round the numbers to three sig figs. Well, <clears throat> what we need to do is find the three sig fig position. And you always start in the far left and you count over three numbers. In this case, this is the three sig fig position, the three, okay? Now that's where we're gonna truncate anything after that, we're gonna truncate it, remove it. 
But then we have to decide, does it three stay three or does it go to four? But to answer that, four. goes a four because we go to the neighbor, use the rounding rules, and it is greater than five, so therefore four become, three becomes four. Okay, so our answer is 1.84, okay? Here, we're being asked to do three sig figs, same, same scenario. Okay, Seven, so one, six. Yeah, yeah so where's our, the six mm -hmm. is the, the six is the three sig fig position, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna truncate everything to the right. Now, bear in mind, that two is before the decimal point. So we're not going to get rid of that. Eventually, we're going, to, we're going to add a zero to that to replace that. Okay, all right. And so we use a we use the rounding rules. So six remains six, and the answer is seven thousand one hundred sixty, not seven hundred six sixteen, because you by doing that by by dropping that two completely, you change the magnitude. We are, to start off, we are in the 7,000 range. That's our magnitude. We're in the 7,000. So our answer should remain in the 7,000 magnitude. Okay, this might be a little trickier, but we know that those leading zeros are not significant. So we don't count those. We just start at the first integer, which is 1. And so our third six fit position is that one right there, that, that number. We look at the neighbor, neighbor's less than five, so therefore one remains as one, and so that number becomes 0 0.00136, okay? Now, we're doing this because you may have multiplied or divide and you got that big old answer, you know, 131154, but that wouldn't be correct to report you because you had uh, numbers that had three sig figs, so your answer should have no more than three sig figs. So this number here, we just uh, rounded up or left the same. That would be the correct answer to uh, report. Three sig figs, the nine is the three sig fig position. Again, two and five are before the decimal point. We just replace them with zero, okay? And, and that just completely drop. All right. Which brings us to this. Now, this is where sometimes the confusion sets into play, but when we add and subtract, we don't care about significant figures, okay? All we care about is decimal places. When we multiply and divide, we care about significant figures. Now, it seems a little bit different, but what's happening when we add and subtract, again, we cannot report an answer more accurate than the least accurate number. Okay, so let's take this example. We're going to take 13.5478 and subtract 11.20. You can see who has the least number of decimal points, the 11.20, right? And so our answer should not have more than two decimal places. Do not confuse sig figs here, okay? De decimal places are only for adding and subtracting. So when you do the math, you can see I got a, I got a truncate at the, at the second decimal point, which is the four. So you do the rounding rules, the four becomes a five. And so your answer is 2.35, okay? Let me emphasize a point here in that. How many sig figs does this number have? Six. Six. Exactly. How many here? Four. Four. And our answer ends up with? Three. Three. Okay. So sig figs is not a factor in adding and subtracting. You, what is a factor are the decimal places because the 11.20 is the least accurate measurement that you have. So your answer should not have more than two decimal places when you add and subtract. 
Okay. All right. Focus on decimal places when you add and subtract numbers. This is just a reminder about your, your decimal places for, for numbers. All right. Now, when you multiply and divide, now you focus on sig figs. Okay. The final answer should, should have the same number of sig figs as that number that has the least number of sig figs. So if we take 3.546 times 1.4, okay, who's got the le least sig figs here? 1.4. 1.4, okay. This is a measurement maybe, maybe the 3.546 meters you measured with a laser beam. And the 1.4, maybe you measure with a ruler, with a ruler. Okay, so you are governed. You are governed by the accuracy of 1.4. Okay, and so you do the find. You do the complete math. Don't round up anything before you do the math, or truncate anything. Get the numbers that you're given. Do the math. Here in this case, we get 4.9644. Now, go to the second decimal, uh, second sig fig position, do the rounding rules, and you end up with 50 point, 50, 5.0. Okay, how did they get, how did you get meter squared? What's the deal there? How's that happen? Uh, meters times meters. Yeah, you, you got it. Exactly, your units. So when you're doing these kind of maths, don't forget about the units that come along, okay? Okay, so multiplying, dividing, focus on, focus on sig figs. Okay, which brings me to uh, scientific notation. This is nothing more than a shorthand way to write humongous numbers or extremely tiny numbers, okay? So hopefully your calculator has a scientific notation function. I'm gonna show you uh, one type of calculator, then I'm gonna pull up the Windows 10 calculator, show you how that works. But what we have here is we're gonna be using big numbers. And you can see here, we got, you know, one, five, six, seven, it's, it'd be tough to input that number in a lot of handheld calculators. A lot of them won't even accept it. But you have to, if they have a scientific notation a function, which most calculators now, nowadays do, most scientific calculators um, have that, you, we need to input that. Or whether it's an extremely tiny number like 0.000000, et cetera, 324, we need to input that. Okay, so. How do we write scientific notation? Well, the format is is this. Uh, okay, notice that we have this number here. Now it's, it's estimated as 93 million miles from the Earth to the Sun. Okay, so we're going to write this in scientific notation. So what we do is we go to where the decimal point would be. In this case, the last position of the last zero. And we count the number of decimal places to the left until we reach the last integer and we stop right before it. So in this case, starting from the far right and you stop it in front of the, the nine, there are seven decimal places. So we write 9.3 times 10 to the seventh power. Now, this is just a shorthand way of writing. Let me write this. This is just a shorthand way of writing 9.3 times 10. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, because every 10 there has an exponent of one. And when we multiply these, 
you add the exponents. So guess what? You got seven tens. Okay. And so you can see do that mathematically longhand, you're gonna end up with 93 million. So 9.3 times 10 to the seventh is a shorthand way of writing 93 million. Okay. Now the notation, the, the standard notation is you're always gonna have an integer followed by the decimal point. This one here as written is not the, not the format. 93 times 10 to the sixth. Yes, that is 93 million, but that is not the correct scientific notation format. The correct is nine point and then whatever numbers follow. And in this case, three. Okay, so it's an integer, decimal point, and whatever digits follow. Now, the thing, thing to keep in mind is that when we start writing significant, uh, numbers and if you're not sure how many how to write the correct significant figures if you put it into scientific notation you will be correct a hundred percent of the time because the 9.3 represents two sig figs okay now anytime you convert a number to scientific notation first notice how many sig figs your starting number has 93 million has two sig figs Therefore, our answer would have two sig figs, okay? Excuse me. All right, so uh, the last example, we had a number much, much greater than one. So we went from right to left and the exponent was a positive. When we have a number much smaller than one, find the decimal point. In this case, we're going from left to right. What that tells you is that we have to, the exponent you're gonna have is always gonna be a negative value. Okay, so in this case, starting where the decimal point is, and you move to the right, you will count 10, de 10 decimal places right after the one, okay? You have two, sig figs, so your answer should have two sig figs. So it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Negative 10, so the negative tells you it's a number much less than one. All right, here you're being asked to convert the following numbers into scientific notation. If you're given this type of problem, step number one is determine how many sig figs you have. Because your answer should have the same number of sig figs. So number one has how many sig figs? Six. Six. Yeah. Exactly. How about number two? Three. 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 And that's correct. Number three? Three. Three. Three again, how about number four? One. One. One sig fig. Okay, once you determine that, then you find the decimal point for the first one. It's right after the eight, obviously. We gotta move to the left until we find it's in front of the last integer. So we're gonna move it to the left two decimal places. So we're gonna end up with 5.48005 times 10 to the second, okay? Uh, I'll give the answers here in a second. The second one here, we're gonna to move to the left until we find the last integer again, we can stop in front of it. So we're gonna have seven decimal places. How many sig figs we said? Three sig figs. So we're gonna have 6.81 times 10 to the seventh, okay? Number three, it's a number less than one. So that should flag, flag you and say, oh, I'm gonna have a negative coefficient. So the decimal point is going from left to right. I'm gonna stop right after the first integer. I got three decimal places, so I'm going one, two, three, and four. So that should be 4.00 times 10 to the negative four, okay? And then finally, the last one, 2000, I only have one sig fig, so that would be two times 10 to the, to the third. Now, if, for example, you're asked a question like 2000, and they're asking you to write it with three sig figs. How would I do that? Yeah.
questions asked. Um, oh, wrong word. The question is asked, uh, right, 2000 with three SIG figs. Okay. Now, if I were to write, say, well, happen if I go 2000.0, what happens there? That would be it would be, it would be what? Correct. It would be correct. There'd be four sig figs, so that won't work, right? So even if I left the point, uh, that's you know, no, not four, five. That would be five. That's five. And if I let, took that out, I'm at four sig figs. And if I took the decimal point, I'm back to one sig fig. So how could I write it with three sig figs? Would it well, be two point zero zero? You got it. You would take you would take convert it to significant figures, the scientific notation, excuse me. And uh, times 10, I don't have superscripts, so that represents my superscript. Okay, so now I can take 2,000 and write it 2.00 times 10 to the third. Okay, and that gives me uh, three sig figs. And if they ask you uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's 10 sig figs. Okay. You haven't changed the magnitude. You just added some zeros there. If you take that, multiply everybody by 10 three times, you still get 10,000, okay? But with respect to sig figs, you've introduced the correct number of sig figs. So sometimes questions like that pop up. Okay. Uh, all right, next. All right, so how do we do it on the, on the, on the calculator? Okay, well, some calculators, this is kind of a little bit, little bit dated calculator, but uh, most calculators have one or two buttons. And this one here, they have the double E button, okay? Some have an EXP button. And an example of that would be the calculator from Windows. Now, you're not familiar with, I got Windows 10, that's your standard calculator. If you click up here, you'll get into the scientific calculator. In this case, there's an EXP button. That is the scientific notation for that, for the Windows. And some calculators have an EXP button up front. Or it could be a second function. So you got to hit a second function button first. The other button that you see is this one here that I'm pointing to. What that does is toggles your number to be negative or positive. Okay? That one you might need because you might need to add a negative exponent or a negative number. Let me go back to the slide. Here, on this calculator, on the, uh, la the, la the right, bottom right, gray, the last one on the right, that should toggle for positive and negative. Okay? And so to input that, you simply type in 2.39, hit the EXP button or the double E button, and then type in nine. You don't have to type in the 10. Now, some of your newer calculators, and this is fairly new, I saw that a few semesters back, they have, um, and so we have the, the EE button or the EXP button. Some new ones have a button, it's a lowercase x, and then 10, and then a, a subscript, superscript, lowercase x, okay? Not to be confused, not this button, where it's by itself 10 to the power x, totally different, okay? So that the one on the left, the x, 10 to the x power, that is your scientific notation. I saw some of, some of the newer calculators have that. 
And so if I wanted to type in a, a, a number like that number there, and I'm using the windows, I would 2.39, well, let me clear this thing here first, 2.39, I hit the X, okay? You notice there is a letter E and then and a plus sign, and then I hit, the, just type in the X point. That is a representation in the calculator of 2.39 times 10 to the uh, ninth power. If that needs to be a negative, I toggle it with the, the negative button. See, I just toggle back and forth. Now I can do the math like I do any number. I can maybe multiply this, divide this by, uh, uh, I don't know, there's a number that we use quite a bit, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, now we get this big old number in your calculator. I wasn't keeping track of sig figs, but definitely I wouldn't input that whole number. It's just 3.97, so on and so forth, times 10 to the negative 15. My answer would only be limited to what I, whatever sig fig I started off with, okay? Now, that, the E is the value that the calculator gives, and that's not the true, true scientific notation. You got to take that number I just gave you, okay, and type it in as 3.97 times 10 to the negative 15, okay? So All I right. have a question. When you had the negative 8 uh, up there, what did you um, hit to make the, the 8 negative? Oh, the 8? Okay, let me clear this. Uh, so if I needed to make an 8 there? Yeah, or inside, negative. Okay. But Every calculator has a negative a, a button like this. You see a, a plus slash negative. That's my toggle. See, I made that negative. Okay. I don't see so, it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see it right here mm -hmm. on the Windows calculator. Okay, your your calculator should have a button that toggles back and forth negative positive. And so if I go, uh, say. 25, 52, if I want to make this negative 52, then after I hit the exponent, I just click the same button. So that is eight uh, times 10 to negative 52. Okay. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or if I want to start out with the negative, I make that negative first, then the exponent, and then maybe uh, 52 here. So that number represents a negative eight times 10 to the negative 52, okay? The, the number that follows the E in your calculator is what is the exponent in scientific notation. Okay, thank okay? you. Sure, all right. Um, where are we at? All right. Yeah, so don't don't type in in your calculator like 2.39 times 10 to the exponent. This function here would be incorrect. That's not scientific notation. You're gonna you're gonna type in, you know, 10 to the x power just means how many times you're gonna multiply that that number 10. So 10, it wouldn't function properly. Okay. Now, if you have a trouble with that in your calculator, you're not sure. Uh, take a, a snapshot of your calculator and we'll, uh, I'll, through email, and I'll look at it and I'll show you what button you have. The newer ones have the scientific notation as a second function. So also check the manual. If you have the manual, and the manual will tell you how to uh, use your scientific notation. All right. So, So you need your own calculator, okay? Uh, graphing calculators, I can't control that, but officially you can't use graphing, graphing calculators uh, simply because you can program them to do other things. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's do an example here. All right, so I'm gonna take the calculator from Windows and I'm going to 
type this number in. So, and we clear it. It says uh, 2.84, okay, times 10 to the 23rd divided by 7.24 times 10 to the 12th. Okay. Now the answer I get is 3.92265133789. Okay, so would I write that as an answer? This is what I got. Okay. Now, bear in mind that's the that is the uh, format for the cal for the calculator. So I got to get rid of. I'm going to type this in. I got to get rid of that e times ten to the positive ten. Okay. If I had superscript for that, it would look like that. Could could I could I give that answer? For that problem, no, no, no. So I would have to truncate, right? So how many sig figs should my answer have? Three, three, three. exactly. Because because two eighty four is three, seven twenty four, seven point two four is three. So my answer would be truncated right after the first two. We all agree? Yes. Correct. Okay. So that is what I would present. Okay? Good. Wait, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So the uh, the uh, the 10 to, uh, to the 10th power would still be there, right? Like in the in the answer that the 10 to the 10th power would still be in the answer. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. Cause you're in, yeah, because it's like you're. That'll be nine. I know three point nine two, and then you gotta move that decimal point. Uh, you know, if I if I were to write this out longhand, um, it would be um, three ninety two, right? Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, one, two, eight, eight, des eight zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Would that be right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, just making sure. Sure. Yeah, you you can't forget you can't forget that part. So that would be my my answer. I gotta put I put that in scientific notation. Three point nine two times ten to the ten. So, which is simply that number there written longhand. Okay. All right. Good question. But <laughs> this is what I just mentioned. Some calculators don't have an E, but they just throw an eight on top. That is not scientific notation. That's just a format because you're limited with the LCD readout of your calculator. They just move a, the number, like in this example, eight on top. That needs to be converted to correct scientific notation. So this would be 1.2345678910 and times 10 to the eight power. Okay. Uh, sometimes the numbers are um, presented not in scientific notation, but you may have a button that puts it back in scientific no notation for you. Like uh, in, in the Windows calculator, we get an F. It's called uh, a floating point or engineering. If I click that back, that gives me that number longhand. Okay, so sometimes your calculator has a, that same function, but it's a second function. So you instead of having to sit there and count all the zeros and figure out how what's the exponent, ha have the calculator work for you. 
So that, that is 3.92 times 10 to the 10th power. Okay. Um, we're pretty much finishing up here. I got what, seven minutes? Seven minutes, we'll be done. We got like one slide. Okay, percent. I, you already know how this works, okay? 100 point question, you got 80, what's your percent? 80%. 80%. So a percent is pretty straightforward. The part represents normally the smaller amount, and the whole is the total amount times 100. Now you got the grade. So the grade question, but you can apply this for any multiple things. You have a ring, it has a total mass of 239.45 grams. Okay. You do an analysis, on it, analysis of that. Uh, material, it has 192.38 grams of pure gold, okay? If you do your percent right, you shouldn't have over 100%. And something's not right in your math, okay? So you're taking 198.38 and dividing it by the whole, which is 239.45 times 100. Now you keep track of your sig figs like you normally would, okay? So your sig figs, you shouldn't have more than five sig figs because you're dividing uh, both the numerator and denominator, both contain five sig figs. So you get that big number there, but then you truncate like the rules tell you about truncating the, at the five significant figure position and don't forget your percent symbol. So that uh, material has 82.848 pure gold. All right, so work out the work out the the worksheets, like the problems. You have any problems? Uh, you may have forgotten, but I'm here on Mondays from one to two on uh, Zoom office hours. So feel free to drop in, and uh, with any questions. And if that doesn't work for you, again, email me. Uh, I'm a little bit delayed on the email, but I've had I've been having some. Uh, technical problems here, but I'm getting that corrected. So I'll get to you as soon as I can, I promise. All right, any questions? Are there any? Okay, you're done. <laughs> After two. All right, let me, let me uh, stop the chair, share, share.